Firstly, he's going to talk about what did Australian school students learn about the Great War during the Great War? What did students learn about the war today? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you. And I must say, I very much enjoyed yesterday too, having refreshers and learning entirely new content myself. So this has been a wonderful opportunity for updating. So welcome everybody. Thank you for the, uh, your interest. And I'm going to pretty much give you in 30 minutes what I could talk about for hours. And I'll probably do a bend and move around out the front shortly too. Um, I'm going to start by taking you through and modelling quite a bit of what is actually what I'm talking about. So this session is, is a very practical, hands-on approach, but it's something that you'll be able to do yourself so you don't have to divulge you know, anything too personal about your understandings or not of different aspects of um, this history and different ways of teaching. Um, I'm going to use resources that pretty much look at how Belgium, France, um, there's also some Russia, some America, and a few other nations um, were represented to Australian school students during the Great War. There will be a consideration of New Zealand as well, because I'd like to suggest to the New Zealanders here, because I do want to include them, that pretty much a lot of the sorts of books and resources and readings and even exact same articles that were circulating in Australian schools during World War I for school students to read were pretty much the same in New Zealand. And very often there was a, an exchange of resources plus Canadian and other Commonwealth countries feeding in their school resources into the Australian school system. So there's a lot of um, interplay across there. A Victorian education department and its experiences of the Great War are my niche interest area. But some of the examples I'll give to you today too pertain to any type of school in Victoria and indeed any type of school in Australia. And there is a big resource coming out in March, April that will be available online and a free copy will be distributed to every Australian secondary school that will explore how schools and how teachers responded to the events of World War I. So even our New Zealand colleagues will be able to access that it's through the DVA website, the DVA um, <laughs> website, which sometimes receives some negative press. But if anyone was to ask me if, in being an author, the lead writer of the materials that are going out this year, if I felt I was peddling mindless militarism into schools, I would stand there and look at them and say, most definitely I am not. So um, I'll leave you to be the judge, though, when you visit the website and look at the resources come March, April. So I'm going to whip you through some activities. I'm going to model what I'm talking about. And some of the resources I'll give you today to take away are actually drafts. So they have been superseded, but I don't have the current draft, which is at the printers, um, able to share with you today. So um, I will make my PowerPoint available after this session. This was the abstract, so you don't need to read it because in fact we're modelling inquiry methodology today. So in fact, I don't really want you to know what we're going to do as part of the inquiry method process. So what does inquiry method mean? I spent quite some time last night trying to find the definition of inquiry methodology in the Australian curriculum because the uh, inquiry methodology is supposed to be the preferred pedagogy of the Australian curriculum, that which is also up for review, but teachers will be working with it and it will be happening at least until the review is um, completed. I also visited the Ausbells website, which is Victoria's set of curriculum documents. And whilst I didn't go to every other state and territory, I did do general Google searching using key names and words. And I came to the opinion that in schools, most teachers and educators know or he have heard of the term, what is inquiry method. But you know, it hasn't really been redefined in recent years and made perfectly clear to teachers. And this was a realisation I came across last night, assuming that there must be some scholarly reference to what inquiry method is in the Australian curriculum. So I went back to a favourite one that I often use, and in fact I thought, well, this might be my great chance to, you know, find the latest that in 2014 I'll be able to walk around and say what curriculum authorities are using as their definition, but I'm still going back to my favourite 1996 one, 
Hampstead and Mur Murdoch, where inquiry method means students and teachers frame questions before they embark on the inquiry. They then proceed to locate, organise and analyse evidence, and ideally not the ready-made perfect textbook that has the synthesis of the author's views and everything, but we're talking primary sources. Evaluates, synthesises and reports on conclusions based on analysis of those primary sources. Takes action of some sort. Now that's the citizenship and civics and citizenship education and global education perspective in that it's all very well to know and to learn something or what are you going to do with it and particularly with regard to creating a more just and sustainable society and environment locally and globally and then reconsider the consequences and outcomes of each phase of that experience that the students have gone through and what are essentially their tentative conclusions or their tentative hypotheses. Because true inquiry method and the work of historians is the work of historians. And that is that rarely can any of us walk away and say, okay, I know everything about everything. This is it, it can be boxed, it's perfect, that's it because almost certainly there'll be new evidence or something will change. So that's part of the historian's joy, isn't it? And the history student's joy, that there's always something new to learn and an exciting way to go about it. But then I added my own three little uh, <laughs> extra bits. So actually, I haven't written an article on this in 2014, but I just thought, standing here today in 2014, these are my, um, my little refinements to the Hampstead and Murdo Murdoch model. The idea that students can, if they're undertaking any sort of inquiry at secondary school, you know, okay, we're doing this topic this term, think what you'd like to learn about, let's go to the library or the computer lab, find out what you want to know and then report it in any way you like. Frankly, that is lazy teaching and it is not inquiry method. So I do think a teacher does have to have some input in helping the students frame their questions and a clever teacher might also help the students frame their questions along the lines of what the teacher might have liked them to ask in the first place. Um, also, we all start with a prior knowledge. So every one of us in here, even though they might not think they know much about how Belgium was represented to Australian school children during the Great War, any bets you do, because you will be building on prior knowledge. And that point too I made that as part of the whole history experience and inquiry method approach, we really can never permanently 100% say this is definite because there will always be new evidence challenging what we do. So here are your activities. Just quietly on your own, no discussion at this point, I'd like you to write down the names of three countries that you believe Australian and New Zealand students in schools primary and secondary definitely learned about during the Great War. So just drop those down, three names. And then, what is one thing about each of those three countries that you believe the students learned? So if they learned about X country, what is just one preliminary summary of what you believe they learned? Now, what I'm going to take you through today and present you with is, as draft pages, and I'll just explain. So I've got draft papers here of the Department of Veterans Affairs resource, but I don't have an electronic copy. But indeed, as I said, sent into every school in Australia around March, April, will be a set of documents that pursue a whole range of investigations, absolutely fully coloured and rich in primary sources representing government, Catholic, independent, Lutheran and Quaker schools in Australia during the Great War. 
So you'll be able to get all that information about a host of investigations as that resource that's going into schools, but also if you go to the Department of Veterans Affairs website and you will go to the Commemorations tab, then to its Education tab, then to its Education Resources tab, and then to its Resource Kits, Books, Websites and Online Publications. seven sets of questions and I'm going to take you through one today. So the resource will ask, one, what did school students learn during the Great War about the British Empire, its allies and its enemies? And that's the investigation I'm taking you through. Two, what sorts of values were expected, were, were expected of students in different schools during the Great War? Three, what were some of the consequences of the Great War for daily life in schools? Four, what patriotic activities did many students perform on the home front during the Great War and why? Five, why did some older students and teachers enlist directly from schools during the Great War? Six, how did members of school communities during the Great War respond to the death and wounding of people they knew? And seven, what can we learn about the experiences of our school or local community and its people during the Great War? That, that final investigation also includes, well, what can we learn? How, how can we be those better global citizens as a consequence of learning about what happened during the Great War? So, you've now got your preliminary understandings about the countries you believe were um, taught about, and that's in Australia and New Zealand, in World War I, in um, schools of all kinds. There are shades of grey, of course, and there are exceptions, but there are also some general comments we can make. I'm now going to give you 12 sources only from the hundreds that are in that forthcoming DBA school resource. And your question is to see how much you knew already and what else you can learn from looking at those primary sources. So I'm going to hand out the handouts and you're at, you have to answer and on your own just have a gentle, uh, relaxed breathe. How nice is this? You can just sit here for a little while and just read the colourful pages I'm going to give you. And in the light of what you read, consider the extent to which your preliminary hypotheses about which countries were involved and what students learned about have been confirmed or challenged. And if something has been challenged, what have you learned? Yeah. Oh. I'm your I mean, we've known each other for too long <laughs> and that old, mature teacher. Another <laughs> we've been, well, I know we've been teaching together for too long, aren't you, Brad? So one each of these, please, to every, I'll just bundle around. I'll just give them to um, bundles in tables. Um, sorry, oh no, sorry. Mature, we've been teaching, we've known each other for a long time. Yeah. And I'm trying to get to the... Um, but I've got smaller versions of the same thing. So I'd rather get the larger ones too.
I'm going to have to hurry you along. You're all intelligent people, so I'll, I'll assume that you've picked up you know, some key points. Could you just talk with the people at your table and discuss whether there's anything there that confirms what you wrote initially, or whether you've discovered something that quite challenges what you wrote, or whether you've learned something quite surprising altogether? So could you just have a discussion at your table, please?
True. Oh, in the, uh, this uh, one. Uh, yeah. awesome. But look at the questions that they actually had. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he, but even though they try to try to he's in charge. He's in charge. Yeah. 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 And they're more the about the Turks. Um, her understanding of that is that to make the foe more noble, in fact, makes you as the victor, victor even more noble. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's one of those contestations that, you know, Ben talks about, was talking about before. But yes, but that is an interesting point. And I'm glad even you used the term the common humanity, because I, I raise that so often with my student teachers to use with their students because no matter what we're talking about, there is an underlying common humanity. You're looking at me because my time's coming up. And no. just, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, someone else, I saw another hand up in that back area. Any other insights? So pretty much it's what you considered. Okay, that may be, oh yes, the case for you as people who are you know, tertiary educated and have arrived at this point having been through the process. But I think for many school students, a lot of this would be interesting. Even the fact of, for example, that school history textbook, I heard this table over here talking about the diet of British history that was common, and that's in the Tasmanian readers, but I've seen the readers for other states as well, and it's very similar. Your comment, please. It, it had a broader amount of country. And actually, that also is um, one of the differences between how, I guess, 
history and geography were taught a century ago and how they are taught in schools today. And rightly or wrongly, and there's arguments for and against, students did learn a lot about the geography of European countries, their great rivers, their great cities, their industry, their agriculture, and so forth. And so this is not just an isolated um, experience. It's the same in the, the Whitcomb and Tombs textbooks that were used by Australian and New Zealand children. There was a lot more focus on learning many aspects of different countries. Whereas today, if, to talk about the differences, when many of the teachers today may be teaching about the Great War in their history classes in schools, how many are talking about the Serbian experience, the Italian experience, the um, Belgian experience in these ways? So that is one of the differences, I have to say. Okay. And what I've also given you, and we won't have time to read this, but you may read it with interest, and particularly when I knew that we would have um, a, a significant number, I was told, of Belgian and French people and French language teachers as well. I've given you six pages from my book, Our Schools and the War, and in particular, some focused looks at how um, Australian uh, or Victorian government school children, what they learned about um, French and Belgian children at that time. Yeah, I think perhaps there's some, are there some spare handouts? Yeah, there's some spare ones for everybody. Oh. Um, I'm happy, no, this is okay, sorry. I'm glad that there's more people here than I actually thought there might be, so that's a good thing. So for the French, the teachers, of France and Belgium and anyone with a particular interest, you will see once again how those countries were represented to school children at the time. And also in those pages are some representations of Russia, the United States, and not Turkey or Germany because that could be a whole much bigger, larger um, shades of grey discussion that I could have with you because I, I might just toss in very quickly. Victoria's education department, for one, did not resort to the propaganda of bitter dislike of Germans during World War One, even though it did. It actually expressed dislike of German military methods and German militarists, but it actually, and it and some other quite learned um, educators at the time in Australia, did not engage in the propaganda against the Germans. And I wonder if anyone knows why, anyone with an educational history background. Please. I suggest the fact that Monash spoke fluent German, both poetry and in the novel, and played such a prominent role in the Australian military, and it comes from the toilet. I suggest that. That is, well, there are some valid components to that argument. That wasn't what I was thinking, but there may be shades of that, yes. Because there's so many German settlers in, say, South Australia, and like, there's lots of German towns in Australia, like Fredericksburg, and all this, like, kind of. True. The main reason, though, is that up until the years directly before the war, and even in Victoria, in the school paper, in, 19, in August 1914, the compulsory reading that went out into Victorian government schools, and that school paper also went to Western Australia, it was bought by Western Australia and Tasmania as well. The Germans were spoken of as being a most cultured, highly educated people. And in fact, the education system of most of the states and territories, states of own territory, sorry, in the, in the very beginning of the 20th century, was very much German-based. That's a little known fact. British and the best of the German was inter integrated into the foundations of Australian education systems. So to suddenly go from having embraced educational theory, even in your own magazines and education gazettes, it was too big a jump. And so a lot of Australian educators admired German educators, although they might not have admired German militarists. So, so Rosalie, when did those posters come out? Okay, okay. those posters yes. are, well, they came out from the outbreak of war pretty much not, not long after. I don't have the exact months, but it will be 1914 
They were anti-German, but they were not reproduced in a lot of Australian government school magazines. So, if you, yes, I've looked at all the magazines of that era, and there was none of that um, the vile Hun ever presented to Australian school students, in government schools at least. Okay, so in your own time, you might like to read up on from our schools in the war, what students at the time learned about France and Belgium in particular. And if this was an, if I'd taken you through the inquiry, entire inquiry method approach, I would have elicited a lot of the views of you from that very first set of information evidence I gave you. I've then given you the second set, which is the pages from my book, which would confirm or challenge your second set of hypotheses. And then I would ask you, okay, to do a, a plenary and we can share what we came across. So would anyone like to just ask any questions now about or say anything about what they see as what they consider to be the differences and the similarities between what was taught a century ago in Australian schools and what is being taught about the war now? And we've had a couple of comments. I'd just like to finish up probably by just asking for a couple more because I think it's quite an interesting and at times controversial set of issues here. So I saw a hand up there, please. Yeah, I I think now we really try and not to, to take away the biases. We try to be able to see it from each of the points of view. And the way that I approached with my teaching of World War One this year wasn't um, like the kids wanted to go the good guys and the bad guys, and yes. who won and who lost. Yes. And it wasn't about that. Yes. It was more about um, who was involved and why were they involved and what were their beliefs in it and things like that, which was more of a taking away the the personal opinions of it and just looking at, well, these are the facts, these are what happened and being able to look at it a little bit more of that way rather than, I mean, a lot of these, are, a lot of the resources here are anti-somebody and taking away that anti-somebody and making it more open. Yes, no, it does make sense, yes. And I would agree that that's what I would hope most teachers are aiming to do. Anyone else? And the difference in the poetry of the First World War, where they started off with so much euphoria, and then the disillusionment of the poets, and they, you know, played the game, and it was like going out to get match or something, and then the complete disillusionment. Yes. Teachers wrestled with that a great deal. And how can I say Victoria's education department dealt with that? Its continuing line throughout the war was, whatever is happening, whatever news we receive, we have people we know, including your family, family belonging to our friends in the school, our teachers, the husbands of our teachers, the sons of our teachers, are over there dying and suffering. And so the appeal was, whatever you feel, you must convert, convert that energy and that angst into some sorts of comforts activities. And really, that's how the system coped. Yes, please, Amanda. Nice loud voice, sorry. Sorry, so we're yeah. on that activities, um, you'll find that a lot of the schools during that period would, would have campaigns within the school of meeting or, or um, being in contact with 
people overseas as a group. Um, and just as, a, as an aside, there is an enormous amount of primary source material if you go to the Australian Society of Archivists. <laughs> Sorry, Rosalie. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if you go to the Australian Society of Archivists, special interest group for school archives, um, if this is an area that you particularly want to build on further, you will find an enormous amount of primary source material in school archives. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, Investigation 7 in this resource is all about schools going out, school you know, teachers, students, and anyone interested going out into their local, in, in, looking in their own school archives, looking in their local communities and their state archives authorities and finding a lot of primary sources too. Now, I'm going to do something rather awful. I've decided I probably should collect back from you the, um, the small handout that's the DVA one. Because I've just, even though I've got permission to share that with you, I'm just thinking as a security thing because it's not due to be released. So I just could I just get back from each of you please that one that was the one that has the source is 1.1 to 1.12. But otherwise I'm here for the two days. I love talking about and encouraging research into this area. It's something that um, most most teachers don't realise and most school communities don't realise the heavy burden that schools bore in World War I. In particular, the very high enlistment rate of teachers. Australia's teachers were more likely to enlist than Australia's non-teachers, this is my own research, more likely to enlist early, more likely to be promoted to junior officer ranks, more likely to lead assaults, and more likely to die. And it's almost because they were those leaders and those motivators in their communities.